Uh, welcome to Caching in the Northwest. Did you know this is the official podcast of Geo Woodstock 18 right here in the great Pacific Northwest? Each week, we're going to talk about caches and cashers from here and all around the globe. So while you're discovering every little paper cut with hand sanitizer, we'll be caching in the Northwest. Yeah, I've been there, done that. Oh, man. Well, the monkey is out on assignment this week. So I'm going to have to bring in, how about a musical mathematician? Some say he can manually recalibrate our GPSR. Others say he's made of 50% formulas, 50% proofs, and 50% imagination. All we know is he's called Limax, and he's welcome to the podcast. Good evening, everyone. Good to have you here. It's good to be here. Good to have you. You haven't been here in a, in a handful of Sundays, in a month it's of Sundays. Been, it's been a while, yeah. Yeah, it's been a little while. Um, in fact, you looked it up. You said show 150. Yes. And we're at 361. So we made a mistake in not bringing you back sooner. <laughs> you, you've had a lot of great shows in between, and I'm not going to begrudge it. <laughs> oh, well, though he may not have been on as a co-host, he's always active in the chat. And we appreciate yes, that. Yes, he is. <laughs> and uh, GSM Time Sue says, you're the latest victim. I, I mean, guess. Yeah, he asked who I was going to tease intro here without a monkey. So, Limax is the victim. That's right. All right. Well, we're going to talk about navigation systems in a minute. But first, I want to give you a quick reminder that we do appreciate the support of all of our patrons who help to keep this podcast coming each and every single Thursday night. We bring the internet to a screeching halt. We also want to, we especially want to thank Land Sharks, our corporate Denali level sponsor. You know, Land Sharks is still open and shipping every day. And now, fire tax are on sale until the end of May. It's now June, so those notes are old. But if you can get a time machine, go back to May and get some fire tax. But be that as it may, with the long days of summer here now, it's, all, it's still a great time to be thinking about placing, maintaining, or going out and finding some night caches. And, you know, we love night caches. Land sharks will help you see the light. Order some fire tax for them because even if they're not on sale, they're still going to be a great deal. If you want to know more about supporting the show, go over to cachingnw.com and click that Patreon link. Won't you please? You really should. We'll wait here for you. And we're back. Okay. <laughs> you know, they could have paused the podcast at any time and we'd have no idea. They're not really listening. We don't know that right now. All right. Hey, um, Geo Travelers popped in the chat and said, new note, Landsharks has a new product review option on their website. So go check that out, too, after the podcast like over that. here. Yeah. Go review the uh, fire tax. Yes. They're very good. And, folks, what else is very good are glows. And we need your glows. I don't know if you noticed. Last week, we read a pile of glows. Because we love when you send us gloves. Yeah, and people seem to enjoy it. We got some good feedback on that. We really did. That's because people write really good geocaching logs. And they're so good, we put them on the show each and every week. Mm -hmm. That means we need over 52 logs, geocaching logs, every year to keep us going. I should keep going. <laughs> so right now, it's time. For that pre-mentioned glow, the geocaching. How would they send it to us? Well, I think you could send it to us in an email or a field recording. You can email that to feedback at cachingnw.com. You can call in 253-693-TFTC or use the voicemail tool on the website. Because whether you read it or whether you wrote it, great logs make geocaching better. Well, and I think they make Thursday night a little bit better, too. This one, especially this week from CRS 98. It is the geocaching log of the week. G CRS 98 found traditional cache 100. Now, there's an apostrophe there, so I don't know if he found a cache called 100 feet or if it was his 100th traditional cache or whatever. But we're going to read this glow, which says, I had just a few hours this morning to go caching, and so... I decided to concentrate on finding some of the newer caches that had published over the past few months that were closer to home in the Kirkland-Redmond area. 
It was kind of misty, which kept the muggle traffic down, but not so wet as to dissuade me from going outside, so perfect winter caching weather as far as I was concerned. I found everything I had time to look for, so it was a pretty good day in that regard, too. I knew what I was in for as I walked up to grab this one, having done similar caches by this cache owner in the past. As I was in the midst of retrieving it, I got a phone call on a group chat message. Seems as though one of the software engineers from work accidentally butt-dialed a group chat as an audio message. Not surprisingly, the conversation was less interesting than the cache. Another well-done cache, as always, Bounce Bounce. Favorite point awarded and TFTC. Nice. Or should I say TFTC? Bang. Bang. Yeah. Hashtag bang. Or is it bang <laughs> hashtag? Ooh. Octothorpe. Oh, that name still makes me laugh. It tickles me to hear Octothorpe. So, folks, if you want to join in tonight's conversation, use the short, easy to type hashtag nav, N A V. Mm. Or you can type in navigation, navigation systems with YMAX if you want to use that hashtag. That's fine. And of course, if you want to bring something up for the after show, make sure you use the hashtag FATAS for that. Now, we don't have a monkey or a chat lackey this evening. We're, we're a little short in both departments. Hmm. However, Limax has more than enough information to cover two or three shows. So with that, we're going to jump right into it. Yeah. Limax, well, you know what? You haven't been on the show in a while. Perhaps some rare chance somebody here doesn't know who you are. Would you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about you. Hi, I'm Limax. This Very is... good. Thank you. Yeah. Right, thanks good. for coming. This has been some be some nice parting gifts for you on the way out the door. <laughs> no, I'm okay. glad you're here. I'm excited you're here. It's the second best news I've heard all week. The best being that there were 60 games left in the baseball season and the Yankees are winless. <laughs> Works for me. Okay. Okay. Um, well, let's see. I've been geocaching since 2004. Uh, my numbers do not reflect that, of course. Um, I found out through cash about caching through ham radio. Uh, there was actually somebody who used to be on the morning chat that I used to be part of during my commute. Um, he actually may have been a charter member. I don't know if he was or not, but he was describing it and it just sounded very interesting. Um, I asked my wife about getting a GPS and we looked at it and it was, they were pretty darn expensive back then. Um, I was actually able to find a, a cheap one on eBay that was supposedly a non-working model. It was an old Magellan 310. Uh, the Magellan 310 was notorious because it only had two digits of precision after the minutes. Mm. So it made finding caches a little bit harder, but I was able to find it. I actually called Magellan. They were actually able to reset it for me so it would actually work. And um, I found my first 10 caches with that before somebody else... Uh, sold me a, a Garmin GPS 12, which I then found the next 50 with before uh, taking a three year break. Yeah, I so I cashed kind of from 2004 to 2008 uh, and then didn't find another cash till February of 2011 and had been back at it ever since. Um, things changed quite a bit during that time and I started getting more involved with the community. So, and found a lot of really cool um gadget sorts of things uh thanks to a couple of podcasts that i discovered at that point as well so nice yeah oh very cool good history great year to start because that's when wits end and i started well mm -hmm. wits end started first and then yeah. i joined in well i was let's see i actually looked at my i actually started my i got my premium account on january 28th 2004 um, I, I think I created my account before that. Didn't find my first cash till the end of February. And I actually had a DNF on February 29th of 2004. Uh, so, oh. oh, well, I just couldn't find it that day. And then didn't actually find a cash on February 29th until 2012. I think it was 20. Yes, yeah, 2012. You had no idea what it meant back then. No idea. Yeah, it's like when I drove through Virginia and West Virginia and decided not to find any caches because I wasn't really feeling like it. 
And I visited Washington, D.C. and didn't feel like finding any there. So <laughs> yeah, there's three like more that. souvenirs I could have had. <laughs> Fun. And by the way, Wet Custer says it wasn't a three-year break. You just took a great circle route back to caching. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, the great circle. <laughs> nice. Yes. Well, Limax, we brought you on tonight because you know things. You know so much about so many things that we figured we'd just tap into one small part of that, and that's navigation systems. Now, mm -hmm. we're all used to, you know, the, the uh, uh, what is it, decimal, or sorry, the, the minutes, second decimals, yeah, right? The, decimal the seconds. Minutes, seconds, yeah. 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 Um, that we use in geocaching, but there's more than that. And that actually has come along recently and evolved. So we thought yeah. that would be fun to talk about. Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, from what I found from the digging I was doing, um, uh, it looks like the original invention of latitude and longitude is created, accredited, credited, boy, I could say that to Erasthenes of Cyrene, who composed a book called Geography that was part of the Library of Alexandria in the 3rd century BCE. Now, the fact that he's Greek, that actually makes sense because Greek was the Greeks were very much into geometry. Yeah, um, let's, you know, we look at, uh, we get 360 degrees uh, in a circle. Uh, we use degrees quite a bit with latitude and longitude. We don't use radians. We don't use pi uh, with any of that. Um, and just kind of thinking through it, it's like I, I didn't really do any digging on this. My girlfriend and I were talking about this because we did, we happen to discuss mathematics quite a bit, it seems. <laughs> She's a fourth as, grade as you teacher, do. and I've got a master's degree. Go fig. <laughs> but um, she keeps up with me most of the time because she's that smart. Um, but we were talking about the fact that the Babylonians used base 12 and also, I, we think, base 360, which may be where this came from. We're not, we're, we're, we are speculating. I'm not going to go on record and say, yes, this is where it came from. But, you know, this has been around for a while. It makes sense that we're doing this. Now, Hipparchus of Nicaea improved on that system by determining latitude from stellar measurements rather than the solar attitude. Originally, it was done by measuring the sun. And actually, if you go back and listen to an old episode of Geo Gearheads, you'll hear me talking about them when I brought brought my sextant and my um, astrolabe mm. over there and was actually talking about that some. Uh, and they were able to determine longitude, which is really the harder of the two to find, uh, by timing uh, lunar eclipses instead of by dead reckoning. Uh, lunar eclipses, they were able to predict, and this is uh, second century BCE, they were able to predict when and where uh, a lunar eclipse would happen. And then by observing it from another spot, they could figure out the timing difference between the two places and use that to figure, well, we're at this, this longitude. Uh, the first mathematically plotted world map was uh, by Marinus of Tyre in either the first or the second century common era, but we're not sure when using, and this is when they were using prime meridian that was known at the westernmost known land, which was the fortunate isles somewhere off the coast of West Africa. Mm -hmm. So it was not, you know, it was not through Greenwich, England at that point. Um, Ptolemy uh, used it also in his geography book, same prime meridian, but measured latitude from the equator. Um, let's see. And yeah, actually Ptolemy, or excuse me, Marinus of Tyre. Uh, it doesn't say how he measured latitude, unfortunately. Uh, Ptolemy uh, created the full ad adoption of latitude and longitude. Um, and measure latitude by the length of a midsummer day. So all of this, you know, and then it came into came into Arabia in the ninth century. Uh I'm gonna mispronounce this name something awful. All all yeah. Looks like Quarizmi. Qua yeah, he actually is a well known mathematician in math mathematic circles. Hmm. 
yeah, for create for doing this stuff. So that that was a name I recognized, and yeah, he was he corrected Marinus's and Ptolemy's errors and regard regarding the length of the Mediterranean Sea, and caused Arabic cartography to use a prime meridian ten degrees east where Ptolemy had it, and uh, then mathematical cartography resumed in Europe following the recovery of Ptolemy's text all over at about three, 1300. So that leads us up to 1884. In 1884, the United States hosted an international meridian conference. Uh, there were uh, seven items on the list, and I actually looked up which president this was, and of course I can't remember which president because you get into the late 18, 1800s, and I can't remember the presidents anymore. <laughs> um, I think I, I want to say... Alive, I, right? I, I, yeah, I, I want to. Uh, I'm say, thinking Harrison, but I think that's wrong. Look, 1884 United States presidential election. Chester Arthur. Chester A. Arthur. Is that? Is it that might have been Arthur. Or it might have been. Was, he may have been elected in '84. He was. It was yeah, he was elected, so it was it was his uh, predecessor. Yeah. So. But it was at the conference in 1884 that um, it was. Uh, it was passed that the meridian would be through the Royal Observatory in Greenwich at that point. That will be zero degrees. I think that was Grover what Cleveland, I, by the way. What was that? I think it was Grover Cleveland was the 24th president. Oh, okay. Um, what was interesting, though, about that is the fact that, you know, there was 25 nations that attended. Only 22 of them adopted this. Mm -mm. Uh, San Domingo, which is now the Dominican Republic, said... We don't want it there. Hmm. Uh, France and Brazil both abstained from the vote. Yeah, and what's very interesting you know, is France France finally adopted it in 1911, and they called it the Paris Mean Time, retarded by 9 minutes and 21 seconds. Of course they did. <laughs> and then they replaced it with the uh, phrase in 78 of coordinate, coordinated universal time, or UTC, oh. which has always bothered me. They call it coordinated universal time and then the ac or the uh, abbreviation is utc that's because it's french yeah, it's because oh it's yeah french, that would exactly. make sense yeah. wouldn't it universal yeah. coordinate yeah, yeah when i was a kid i couldn't figure out how the soviet union was abbreviated cccp either but that's a whole other story <laughs> <laughs> we kind so, of go that way don't we yeah so as a, as a brief catch-up you started from what 3 bc to 1884 well, yes. into 1978, really. Right. Coordinate systems have been used all along there. Right. That's just amazing to me. I mean, you would think, oh, no, you know, when would they have to do it? Yeah, shipping kind of, you know, pushed it there in the, say, ex exploring maybe in the 13 to 1400s. Right. But right. I had no idea how it, old it was so it is it's been around for a very long time and you know the prime meridian keeps moving and it's rumored that uh columbus uh fudged some of his numbers when doing uh some reckoning of those lunar eclipse when he was over um on the east coast of the united states or you know the mm -hmm. wherever he happened to be at the time um to make it look more like he was, you know, in East India or someplace, something like that, rather than um, completely lost. Completely lost. Yeah. yeah, that was that was one of those apocryphal tales. I found that in some, one book I was reading when I was doing uh, the Geo Gearheads episode. So you you taught me something new. I had no idea UTC was adopted from Paris meantime because they didn't want to play with the rest of the world. Well, remember at the time, Paris had all of the um, the measuring sticks and the kilograms and everything else. They were the custodians, to so to speak, of the measurements of the world. So the fact that England got it and not them, that may have been kind of a slap in the face. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't know. This is like again speculation. Who knows? And, you know, I mean, we look at it now and say, well, yeah, you know, a coordinate system is a coordinate system is a coordinate system. Everybody accepts it. But that wasn't the case early on. No. And the only reason everybody's accepting it these days is because of GPS. But, you know, there's now 
two other, no, actually three other navigation systems up there that are um, operational mm -hmm. at this point. So um, the the United States hold on it may be changing. Although I just found out at work we're getting we're getting a new clock in that's going to be based on GPS. Hmm. Oh, so, interesting. Yeah. So that's still used quite a bit for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yes. Oh, I was going to say the the next thing coming up is is a term that we've all heard, mm -hmm. but probably don't know what it means. Oh, and I'm mean, referring to datum. Datum. Not data, but datum. D a t u m. Yes. So it's not an incomplete datum. Yes. Got it. Yeah, we're we're definitely not going cordless tonight. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. So datum. Uh, most datums, from what I can see, they consist of just really two pieces of data, and from that things can be extrapolated. A semi-major axis, usually represented by the letter A, and the reciprocal of flattening, usually represented by one over F. Now, from what I can figure, flattening is you know the fact that you got the sphere. And you know it's how much, how much from a sphere it is flattened, and of course the Earth being an ellipsoid, it can't just have a diameter. It does have two different things, and from the flattening and the semi-major axis, I don't think. Yeah, oh, actually no, I did include it. I did include that for finding B, which is represented as the semi-minor axis, hmm. which would give you the right angle to the semi-major axis to kind of just define the ellipse at the equator. So, and in there, um, I actually, you know, there's, so, you know, that's basically what a datum is. And, you know, these are, I, I don't know how far back I look. I mean, there was quite a few historical ones here. Um, I actually included a Wikipedia link to the historical ellip ellipsoids, and it was uh, quite the table for that. Um, you're, you're trying to tell us the Earth isn't flat? I'm trying to tell you that the Earth isn't flat. I'm okay. also trying to tell you it, maybe it's flattening. Oh, okay. And, and of but course, they're trying to make the Earth flat. Yeah. Because yeah. it's easier to work with. Yeah. And, of course, everything moves on the Earth, and so it's really kind of hard to say, Okay, this is going to be this point for all times. I mean, yeah, yeah there's been, yeah, I know there's been stories on some of the podcasts about Australia moving so many uh, yard, uh, meters per uh, year. So, mm -hmm. so anyway, looking at um, historical ellipsoids, you know, otherwise known as the datums that we use, uh, most common in North America are, are NAD 27, North American data, datum from 1927, NAD 83, North American datum 1983, and WGS 84, the World Geodesic System of 1984. Oh, that was double plus good. What was that? WGS 84, that must be double plus good. Yes, double plus good. Uh, <laughs> okay, you got me. <laughs> Um, WGS-84 is the one that our GPS system uses. Um, and from what I can tell, they're actually working on a new datum that's supposed to come out in 20, 2022, relying on reference frames from the Global Navigation Satellite System and the gravimetric geoid model resulting from the GRAV-D um, program as well. So we kind of look at some of the stuff I've... I've I've glossed over some of the other spheroid stuff mainly because I couldn't find good references on it. And of course that, I mean, the fact that my notes are already long, this would have made them even longer. Mm -hmm. So NAD 27, which is the one that was used really in North America. Oh shoot. I was going to look that up. Darn it. Mm -hmm. um, I actually have the uh, coordinates to the bat cave from an old episode of Batman. And I forgot to put that in the show notes. Oh, I've seen that. I've looked it up. Yeah. yeah they've got, um, it was actually in a, a uh, King Tut episode of season three that King Tut actually in, uh, announces the coordinates. And I can't okay. remember which one. So, 
ran out of time. Anyway, <laughs> getting back to my notes. <laughs> Um, NAD-27 was based on the Clark Spheroid of 1886, which had its origin at Meads Ranch, Kansas. So Meads Ranch, I think I think that might be near the, um, the geographic center of North America, either North America or the United States. I'm not sure which. So it's based basically just on this con- continent. Um, do you want me to actually read the, uh, the different semi-axis and the flattening, reciprocal flattenings I've gotten here? You know, I think we could gloss over those as well. Okay. So anyway, that was, you know, that's a historical one. And then there's the SK-42 reference system. That's Kraskovsky 1940 ellipsoid. That was that was actually a, a Russian-based one, a uh, USSR-based one. Um, and then NAD-83, which was actually based on the GRS-80 ellipsoid, which I will talk about here in a bit. Hmm. Um, and it's similar to WGS-84. NAD-83 and WGS-84 differ by just very little between the two of them. I was going to say, if you want a, a little bit of real-world numbers there, CRS-98 in the chat says he found his first cache with his GPS set to NAD-27. And oh, wow. Geocaches are all published using WGS-84. He says he was 200 feet off. Oh, that's and, all, huh? Yeah, he says, I never would have found it if it wasn't for the clear hint and the fact that it was in... Easy guardrail cache. So, <laughs> but there's, you know, there you go. The same coordinates and different systems. He was off by 200 feet. Yeah, yeah it's 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 amazing. Um, proves that the Earth moves. Yeah, proves yeah. that the Earth moves. Let's see the, you know, just just for reference here, NAD 87, the semi-major axis for it was six million three hundred seventy-eight thousand two hundred six point four meters. And WGS-84, 6,378,137.0 meters. So the WGS-84 ellipsoid has a, has a smaller uh, um, semi-major axis than NAD-27 did. So. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so was that, okay, is that, is that a, a combination of the earth changing and bad mathematics or improper I say bad mathematics. I would say improvise imprecise uh, surveying. I mean, surveys, you know, surveying has improved over the years mm-hmm. and also, and I really don't know. I, I really can't say bad mathematics. It may be the best mathematics for the data they had at the time. Would okay. be, would be my guess. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I'll talk, I'll just, I'll say really briefly here with WGS 84, um, you know, there's a, uh, there's FAA order 8260.58A, which is the United States standard for performance-based navigation instrument procedure design. Now I've actually used this document to create a bunch of Python scripts for doing some of the harder navigation puzzles that we've got here in the Bay area. Um, they, you know, have, having the level of people we've got around here, sometimes between the labs and the, and the, uh, defense contractors okay. and everything else, we end up with these really things where they're using the actual ellipsoid rather than say like a great circle plot or anything else. And those took me quite a while to actually get, um, get correct and if you actually even looking at what was based on which is the vincenti uh formula those are hard to understand i just said okay i'm just going to enter these in and make sure i get the right answer <laughs> <laughs> this is coming uh, from Limax that things are hard to understand yeah it, it was it's pretty bad also, also i want to mention tom scott has a video called why isn't the prime meridian at the prime meridian um, a YouTube video, and it's a, it's a really good video and a re- really good explanation. Um, his explanations, I find, are uh, on a level that most people can understand. Nice. So, okay, so let's talk on uh, GRS-80. I had mentioned that up before, that NAD-83 was based on it. This was the Geodetic Reference System of 1980, and this is actually the standard for the International Terrestrial Reference System. 
um, that other countries have used. You know, the reason that um, most people use WGS-84 is because um, people are using the GPS satellite system. GPS happens to be an American-based military system mm -hmm. that used WGS-84. So thus, you know, that's what they're using. Um, so in addition to that, we've also got uh, PZ-90, parameter parametry zemli 1990 these are parameters of the earth this is this is the russian based one and this okay. is actually what glonass uses mm, interesting you know, they don't they don't use wgs84 and it's um it's based on the sk42 reference system which i think i did mention up above mm -hmm. as well or Previous, previously up above. How do you, how do you want to put that? I mean, it's up above in my document, but previously noted. Previously noted. There we go. And then we've got the GTRF with the, which is the Galileo Terrestrial Reference Frame. Any idea what that one's used for? Um, it, Galileo used it back in the day. That must be it. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> it, okay. it is for the Gal Galileo satellite system, the European Union's um, navigation system. You, you know, I am so datum centric. I assumed everybody was going off of WGS 84. So did I. And then actually, it was um, it was the GeoGear Heads show two weeks ago where you were talking about. Um, you know, you're talking about the eighth GPS satellite uh, mm -hmm. coming coming off of the uh, you know, being ready to be launched, and um, talking to some about Galileo and trying to you know, can we use Galileo here? And I got to thinking, I wonder, <laughs> you know, do do these other navigation systems use the same JOZ desic datum? And mm -hmm. no, they don't. Interesting. Yeah, it's just really interesting. Anyway, well, in the chat, Boomer365 points out that there's a cache on the island that requires you to change the datum of your GPS to GC17859. Hmm. No, I think that's a, that might be the, uh, isn't that the, no, it couldn't be the geocache name number, could it? Oh, it could be. Because GC17859 GC does not sound like the right. Like, like no, any kind of a data like now. Right. So that must be the, uh, the uh, GC code. Yeah, that's. It's just a thought. I mean, I'm hopefully Homer, hopefully Boomer three sixty five will let us know. Yeah, please do. Yeah, that uh, that would be interesting to have to change your datum for that one and figure right. it out. Right. Okay, so you know, with with all of this out of the way, we finally get into coordinate systems themselves now latitude and longitude latitude goes from negative 90 to positive 90 or 90 south to 90 north um longitude goes from negative 180 west or negative 180 to 180 or 180 west to 180 east um with these you know you the the form that we use the most in geocaching is degrees minutes with um with decimal yeah minutes and a three three digit decimal fraction okay. on it right on that yep. you know there of course there's other ones i mean i first actually became aware of coordinates using degrees minutes seconds yeah yeah that was just what i used and of course you also get decimal degrees on top of that as well. And yeah, for, for the program I had, you know, for the, for the scripts I wrote, yeah, I had to convert everything to decimal degrees. It could say what degrees, minutes, seconds, what, what can we do with that? So, um, thank, you know, thankfully they're easy to convert back and forth between, you know, it's, there's 60 sec seconds in a minute, mm -hmm. 60 minutes in a degree and 360 degrees in an earth. So it it's a reference we understand. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. 
Yeah, very, very much so. And it, it degrees, minutes, seconds is actually so close to hours, minutes, seconds. I mean, it's just something we go back and forth with, mm -hmm. with all of that. Until you're trying to do minutes or uh, do math with, you know, minutes <laughs> and hours. And you're like, wait a minute. How, how, oh man, this hurts my head. Okay. Yeah. And I, I've, I've been there a few times. It's as much as I love doing this sort of thing, I do sometimes forget it's like, now, how do I get to seconds again? Oh, that's right. Multiply by 60. Yeah, and yeah. I'm, of course, I'd be looking at just the fraction to do that with. So so just to catch up on the uh, the chat going on, yes, that's a GC code, 17859. What a difference a datum makes. Okay, I'm going to have to look that one up. And then um, BC Rock Crawler says, I have a geocache. Uh, GC Hotel Mike. Um, Romeo Golf. Thank Romeo you. Golf. I got stuck there. Uh, <laughs> it uses the difference between the NAD27 and the NAD84. And what happens when you enter coordinates in one datum and change to the other datum? Mm. Mm, that would be quite interesting. So I have to check, have to check that one out too. Mm -hmm. All right. So. Now we have dealt with degrees. Shall we look at some other data, some other coordinate systems, gentlemen? So oh, that gets nice. us into the system we know, but there are others yes. that, you know, lots of puzzle caches throw out coordinates in a different system that you look at it and you go, wait a minute, now I got to go figure this one out. Okay, I'll do it because there's a smiley at the end. Yeah. So first one, that, one of the ones that comes up is a uh, UTM which actually is listed as well on all the, you know, on any cash page. Um, I don't know if it is on the app. I didn't look at the app, but looking at oh, the I don't web know. page, you know, it, it does have it there. Um, this actually came through in the 1940s and this, and the NOAA claims it was the army Corps of engineers, but there were some maps in Europe from Germany that have the UTM thing also. So who knows mm -hmm. who actually did it? We'll just say it was, you know, World War II or maybe a little bit post World War II. That, that era has come up with. Yeah. You and know, you, you start talking about different systems and MC3 cats in the chat asks, is one coordinate format more accurate over another? Maybe you're going to get to that. I am actually going to say, no, it isn't. Okay. Um, I actually, I would say that the rest of these I'm going to talk about are compromises compared huh. to actual latitude and longitude. Double um, plus ungood. Not, huh? Double plus ungood. Double plus ungood. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you want, really, if you want precision, you use latitude, longitude. There you go. Um, you know, although what three words might claim that, oh yes, we can find your <laughs> cat in the backyard, but. Cats move. Yeah, cats move, and of course, they're let, they're they're uh, the three words change with them as they move. Silly cats. <laughs> I've heard of cats. I've heard yeah. cat, heard of cats. Yeah, but what was interesting, you know, with the uh, UTM is it was originally based on the Clark ellipsoid, um, which I mentioned above. That was the uh, that was the one that NAD twenty seven was based on. Uh, which would have made sense for the 40s. You know, NAD 27 would be what the United States would have used at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, WGS 84 is now currently used. Um, and just like, um, oh, who was it that said it? Being being off by 200 feet using NAD 27. Oh, I think that was CRS 98. Yeah, mm -hmm. CRS 98 said that. Um, what's interesting is that current UTM can differ from up to 200 meters from the old system. Ah. So you can't, you know, you use old UTM coordinates, you're going to be, you could be off by up to 200 meters, which, you know, might, might be kind of hard to find things that way. Yeah. Yeah. So the way I struggle you, when the coordinates are right on. So, yeah. <laughs> so do I, what do you mean? It's this blinker that looks like a nut. <laughs> So 
So the specifications on UTM, um, each the Earth is divided up into 60 zones, each six degrees in width, and we're talking longitude in this case. Okay. So it's east to west, there are 60 zones. Uh, actually, no, I take it back. This is, yeah. And then polar regions uh, are from uh, from 80 degrees south and 84 degrees north are excluded from from this as well. So, okay. I mean, uh, the latitude bands, which is there, um, which which is would be the north south stuff. That actually was not part of the original uh, UTM, but part of something called the military grid reference system, uh, which actually is what geocaching.com has. They actually use the MRGS, not UTM, but everybody knows UTM and not MRGS. They would look mm. and go, "What's MRGS? I'm what." Are, are they changing stuff? What's going on here? It's because the military likes acronyms. That's right. Yeah, the mil military loves acronyms with all of this. Um, anyway, the the way the latitude bands work is that each of the horizontal zones were divided into 20, zone, 20 bands north to south. It started at letter C at 80 degrees south, omitting I and O, of course. Of course. And then the last band at the top is X, which is about four degrees, and, and it's extended by four degrees in order to make it to eighty-four degrees north. Okay. So, so they're stretching. Yeah, they're yeah. stretching. So latitude, and they actually use latitude bands A, B, X, and Y. A and B are used for Antarctica. Y and Z are used for the Arctic. Arctic. Region. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> location is usually a longitude zone followed by the latitude band. So like 10T or 10U, uh, 10T those notes. being Seattle, 10U being Vancouver. Uh -huh. So I thought you guys wanted to be in the same band, but uh, it's it's a little further apart than yeah. I mm -hmm. thought. <laughs> um, those you know, and that's you know, and then there's you know there those may or not may or may not be used as, uh, and what could also be used is like 10N or 10S. I think actually remember right i actually might be in 10n where i am which would make mm. it very confusing yeah uh if that so if they're just used northern southern hemisphere you might see like a plus or a minus instead since n mm. and s are also regions within the latitude bands and then the grid zones are uniform except for a couple locations i'm going to kind of gloss over that they had to extend some things because well, Norway wanted a little bit more for one region, just probably the way that the region worked. Um, and the position on the Earth is given by the UTM zone and then an each easting and a northern planar coordinate pair. Uh, and that's actually measured in meters. Hmm. Which is which is very interesting. And the point of origin for each zone is the intersection of the equator and the zone's central meridian. So you've got you've got this zone that goes north to south like this. You got a middle of it, and right at right. the equator in the middle of that zone, this could be your. It's going to be where you're measuring from. However, Seems because odd. everybody hates negative numbers, <laughs> they offset it. What? Yeah, to avoid negative numbers, the central meridian of each zone is defined to coincide with 500,000 meters east. So, and then, you know, there's some things that are, you know, where that is. And then the northern hemisphere positions are measured from zero at the equator up to about 93 million meters, or excuse me, 9.3 million meters at 84 degrees north. And then Southern Hemisphere, uh, northings increase decreased from 10 million meters down to about 1.1 million, again mm. to avoid um, negative numbers. <laughs> so actually, in some ways, it's actually good to have that lati that uh, latitude band because otherwise you're going, are you north or you south? Where are you? Yeah. Um, and the calculations themselves, I looked at them. I screamed. I ran away. Hmm. They, yeah, that says a lot. They are, yeah. It, I, 
if I really had to, I could probably try to figure them out. But no, it was it used summations, it used powers, it used uh, infinite series. I mean, it was just it was not not my idea of fun. Well, it just to avoid negative numbers, it just seems like, well, let's just choose a really big number and we'll work from that. Yeah. Right. Well, that's just a little, I don't know. It seems silly to do that just to avoid using negative numbers. It does. And, you know, I may have gotten some of this information wrong. I mean, UTM, unfortunately, was one of the worst defined ones I could find. But apparently people got calculations to say, okay, this is what they are. And hmm. there are websites that convert from UTM to latitude, longitude. So I don't have to worry about it. That's exactly. Right. Exactly. So. Well, in the chat, we have more from CRS 98. He says benchmarks in the U S were usually specified more like a letterbox. And enough of them were placed before WGS 84 that the approximations to calculate the lat and longitude are notoriously in that. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, people have actually gone out to these benchmarks that have numbers on them, mm -hmm. looked at their GPS and said, oh, no, yeah, this is off. And it isn't, you know, off by the 30 feet. You know, it could be off by quite a ways. Yes. And I think, I, I, you know, maybe CRS 98 knows, but I think the datum um, that they were that were used for those were actually stamped on the benchmark as well. But I, mm -hmm. I don't know for sure if that's the case. I know the survey markers that I see at uh, Disney's California Adventure just say survey marker on them. So, yeah, but those I don't think are official uh, USGS no. benchmarks. No, they're probably not. <laughs> Um, I'm looking at one. Did you steal a benchmark? No, I know a guy who has a traveling <laughs> benchmark. Um, I don't see any data. It says U.S. Geological Survey benchmark. Uh, elevation above sea, above sea is on um, this one is 1139 feet, 114 MAT. And then five, nine, six. Okay. I have to say, I have not researched benchmarks, so I can't really say much about that. Yeah, I'm looking at a few of them online, and they vary with the description on them, but I don't see any system listed as to what they're using. Yeah. Oh, I'm looking at one. Uh, there's a $250 fine for disturbing this mark. Uh, but it's the distance above sea level is 1,900 or one or 6,190 feet. And there's a datum, but there's nothing following. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Might CRS 90 says, I don't know if they're consistent. Yeah. Don't know if they're stamped with a datum. He says, I, what you can find online is somewhat different than what was stamped back in the day. Yeah. So. Yeah. Could be. All right. But I'm well, always fascinated when I find them out in the wild anyway. It, it's actually something I go searching for. Yeah, they're fun. Um, every I, I've done world. some, but, you know, like uh, CRS-98 said, they're so far off of their coordinates. You know, you, you do have to use the the written clues yeah. to find it. And sometimes they're gone. Yeah, I actually was looking at my stats the other day, and I actually have one benchmark on my stats. Um, and I can't remember can't remember now when I found it. I think it's after I after my hiatus uh, when I came back that I found it. So, when you return from the circular route, yes, yes when I return from my great circle route. Yes. So, that's anyway. That's UTM. Uh, let's let's move on to another one here. Uh, Earth centered, Earth fixed, otherwise known as ECEF. These are the Cartesian coordinates of the Earth as opposed to the spherical coordinates, which would basically be what latitude and longitude are. Mm -hmm. um, Earth-centered, Earth-fixed um, uses an origin as, you know, you know, being zero, zero, zero at the center mass of the Earth. 
which I'm not sure how much that changes. The positive x-axis intersects the Earth at zero degrees north, zero degrees east, the equator in the prime meridian. Other, otherwise, I think I'm known as uh, Null Island. Hmm. Yeah, where the, where the buoy is out there. Yeah. Oh, oh right. Yeah. Uh, the positive y intersects intersects the Earth at zero degrees north, ninety degrees east. So I don't. I'm not sure exactly where ninety degrees east. It's between zero and one eighty, but uh, about halfway between. Yeah, right halfway in between. Yeah. And then the positive z axis intersects the Earth at true north, which is ninety degrees north. And then conversion is very similar to converting polar coordinates to um, to Cartesian coordinates, like you'd find in any. Uh, I guess it would be a second year algebra book is where we got into thir- three degree, uh, hmm. three, three dimensional oh, right. coordinates. Yeah. X, and Y, and Z. What was that? X, Y, and Z. X, Y, and, X, Z. Y, and Z. Yeah. So yeah, going from Lambda, Phi, and R or H or whatever. I'm not sure. The, the altitude to mm-hmm. um, X, Y, Z. So. Okay. Yeah, and then we have a local tangent plane. I wasn't too clear on what this was for. This looks like it's for local areas. And you know, the east and west axis is tangent to the parallels. The north-south axis is tangent to the meridians. So that's the things that we kind of know. Yeah, it's like you guys are north of the 45th parallel. Yes. So. Uh, and the up and down is correction to the normal oblate spheroid that is used as your ellipsoid. So it's like, okay, that's talk. <laughs> um, there was two methods that were used, east, north, up, which is more used in geography, or north, east, down, which is more commonly used in aerospace. So they, they set their coordinates up differently depending on what it is that you're doing. Huh. Huh. Interesting. And there again, yes, I couldn't find... Um, from what I was looking at, I could not find too much on uh, how you can say even convert from ECEF to it, because that would be the closest thing to it. You would convert to ECEF, and then you would convert to either east-north up or northeast down, depending on your application. I have never seen a geocache puzzle that uses that. Um, there will be one now. There will be yeah. one now. It's like, yeah, I've actually done ECEF for... Uh, a cache around here, you mm-hmm. know, a person gave three point four points. Or I can't remember. It was either three points or four points in ECEF coordinates, and you had to and you had to find the intersection of all of them to find where the cache was. Ah. And then we move on to one of our new favorites. What three words? This one's kind of fun. It is kind of fun. I will say that. Um. It was launched back in 2013, July of 2013, so it's fairly recent. Uh, and it claims a resolution of three meters, which okay. does work for geocaching. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, that works pretty well. Um, it's a proprietary closed platform, although some people reverse engineered it. Yeah, in fact, there's one called What Free Words that supposedly has the... Uh, the um, calculations on how to actually uh, you know, get people from one are to the so other. clever yeah um it uses a grid uh of three meter by three meter squares for each yeah. of the three words so that's approximately 57 times 10 to the 12th so about 57 was it uh let's see one two three four so it'd be 57 trillion squares that's a few that's and quite a few three words you can pick one of those out that yeah, you know, doesn't use those word patterns anywhere else. Right, and uses a word of twenty uses a word list of about twenty five thousand words to to get all that. However, it's got forty thousand words in English because um, they it covers the ocean as well in English. Oh, interesting. Yeah, which is again very interesting. And like I said, yeah, you know, what free words also um, released an open source al- algorithm doing the same thing. Uh, we see this quite a bit in puzzle in geocache puzzles these days. Um, you usually can tell when it is a what three words puzzle. Mm-hmm. And yes, I, I actually have access to the API because I was going to try to you know work on a puzzle that 
required a little more than you know i didn't feel like entering you know several word combinations into a, a word into a web web page yeah so i was going to uh do a brute force search and i never got it done <laughs> well and starcaster says you have to be careful which with what three words many of the words are either singular or plural of the same name that Ooh, makes it a bit so, tricky yeah I still want to be able to mail a package to, let's say, wit's end. I just, you know, say wit's end, these three words. Well, there are, I know there are some company, some areas that are supposedly adopting that. Hmm. Yeah. And actually, what I'm going to be talking about here later on, same thing. Uh oh. Yeah. And I see we're getting, we're getting close. We're here. getting late. So <laughs> let's, yeah. let's uh, talk about a couple more, but uh, briefly. Okay. Well, the next one is Maidenhead, which Wits End and I are very familiar with. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's used quite a bit for uh, ham radio. Um, used actually in some contests, you give your Maidenhead square as part yeah. of your exchange. I live in Charlie November '87, and I think I am in Charlie Mike '97. There you go. Yeah, but I've I you know he's got his memorized, I don't, so I'm probably <laughs> way off. Um. Anyway, I, I do have some stuff about the calculations here, uh, which I which I won't go into at this point. This is actually, uh, it, it, start, it was developed in 1959 uh, in Europe. Uh, the VHF working group met in Maidenhead, England in 1980 to work on replacing the QRA locator system as a worldwide system. So that's why I got the name Maidenhead. It came from Maidenhead, England. Uh. Uh, at the IARU, the Am Inter International Amateur Radio Union Conference of 1999, it was at that point they decided to use WGS-84 as the basis for the lat latitude and longitude for uh, locators. Hmm. So it wasn't until 15 years after the datum was even made that they decided to use it. But let's see, actually, well, yeah, not 1999, I mean, we still didn't have selective uh, availability turned off, although... Most of the time oh. it was turned off even when they said it wasn't. So that's a whole nother story. I didn't know that. Yeah, and I've got some stuff here on calculating. I won't do that. And then we've got the Duke Google Plus code, which is the open location code. There again, I haven't seen any puzzles with this, but I started seeing it on Google Maps and made me curious. Uh, this was developed at Google Zurich and released in late October 2014. So it is the most recent of all of these. And the encoding I found was very, very, very similar to the way they encode Maidenhead. And uh, you know, the interesting thing with with both of those systems is there again to avoid negative numbers. Uh, they start with zero degrees being at the anti meridian, which is 180 degrees from the meridian, mm -hmm. so somewhere near the international date line. And at zero degrees, uh, at, at 90 degrees south, or the South Pole, and making that your zero to go from there. So it goes from zero to 360 and zero to 180 instead of using the negative numbers. And we somehow got through all the nodes. I mean, I had to gloss over some things. I would love to have talked about the calculations on those. I have wow. yet to see a puzzle that uses the um, open locator or the Google Plus codes, however you want to call it. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure it's coming. I'm sure, yeah. Yeah, Wet Coaster said he did a 70 cash GeoArt in Ontario that uses what three words. So that's the first I've heard of that being used out there. That's great. Wow, yeah. And Stark Asher said there was a multi about 50 miles away from me that taught you to use your GPS. It had five stages, and one of them gave the next stage as a UTM port. Hmm. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so... Yeah, it's like, you know, my, um, I know my Garmin does UTM. I don't know if my um, Magellan does or not. So. And yeah, so that's not something you can get a download to update, right? I mean, that's that's built into the unit. That's not a firmware update to switch between. Right, it wouldn't yeah. be. Um, that's why I'm thinking the Garmin does it because the, the 750, uh, the Oregon 750, uh, you could download um, different uh, data fields for doing things, and those are programmed by users. 
So that's why I'm thinking that that may be that one that does it. And my Magellan um, Explorist 510 uh, doesn't. So, well, Limax, thank you for coming on, talking to us. You know about da the the navigation systems, and I had no idea. You know they were so old, and yeah. yet some of them are very new, and none of them are 100 percent accurate. No, I think I think with the fact that the 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 plates keep changing on the Earth and everything else, you can't you know keep things being accurate. And mm -hmm. yeah, the Earth may not be shrink you know may not be shrinking a whole lot or whatever, but it keeps changing, and so it's it's really hard to keep a fixed point on a ever changing um, mass. Yeah, exactly. Um, CRS ninety eight says there's a puddle puzzle in Seattle that uses plus code. I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. So. Well, there you go. It's like I knew there had to be at least one yeah. out there. Yep. Now, did I hear that the um, nuclear disaster in Fukushima, the did that cause a shift? I think it did. In the island? I can recall something like that. And GPS coordinates off? Yeah. And actually, one or two of the tsunamis did as well. Maybe that was it. Maybe the tsunami moved. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we're on, you know, masses floating on a on a hot iron core that just move around. Yeah. And, you know, me living in earthquake country, I mean, that's going to it's going to happen quite a bit. Did you just have one this week? Mexico I might have. I don't one. know. I haven't. Uh, I If we did, I didn't feel it. I thought I, I heard somebody say one in near Fresno. Okay, that's that's about uh, still enough. 100, 150, 200 miles south yeah. of me. So, I heard about a rather significant one in Mexico this week. Mm -hmm. That's farther south yet. That's a, that's even farther <laughs> south yet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we haven't had one here in a while. I mean, yeah, the only significant thing that happened around here is the Golden Gate Bridge started to sing. So, hmm. Yeah. There's another one. Yeah, they use the, the Bay Bridge. Is that the other one? Yeah, the Bay Bridge is the other one. Yeah. yeah. That'll, that'll yeah Bay Bridge has all the lights and the Golden Gate Bridge sings now. So it's like, okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, Limax, thanks again. And uh, I want to take a moment and thank Land Sharks, our corporate Denali level sponsor. Um, you know, landsharks.ca is the outdoor adventure and geocaching store. Check them out online. Because they ship orders every day. Every, every single day. And we also want to thank our faithful Denali-level supporters. You know, they help us prevent negative numbers in the Caching the Northwest Bank account. <laughs> That'd be Land Sharks, JP Geo Designs, Team Squirrel, Groovy Owl, and Cashly. If you, yes, you want to know more about supporting the show, click the Patreon link on the CachingNW.com website. Just like... Limax did. And LG9000. And, well, we already mentioned Cashley. Cashley, yeah. T Sayer. How about Keats94? Kettle Barb. Genies. B Pendragon. On a boat. Fairwood West. Seabeck Tribe, the traveling Seabeck Tribe. That's right. Enjoy California. Kid Vegas19. Why no Seattle? Broncos Fan for Life. M Nerve. Camp Clan. Trexer Zero. The Geo Travelers. Kev McD. Subway Mark. Ala Robrick. Andreas. Boomer365. Islands Guy. <laughs> GeoNap Bros. Logwork. Team Noltex. Wet Coaster. Kitty Quest. Dune Buddy. Green Words. CRS98. MC3 Cats. Hacker Doc. Hold on, my screen is scrolling. Tick <laughs> Magnet. <laughs> GSM times two. Billy Robson. Dora Moore. Sprouter. And Segehove. Thank you all. Hey, if you want to find out more, head on over to cachingnw.com slash host. You can read our bios. You can find links to social medias we probably don't look at anyway. Wait, I wasn't supposed to say that out loud, was I? Mm. Uh, social media platforms that you know, we check every day because we love you. And uh, lots of, of secret things that we don't tell other people. We're just curious to see if anybody goes there. 
<laughs> but most of all, <laughs> oh, <laughs> White Coaster says you split us up. That's yeah. right. I did. Finally. You're welcome. Or maybe not. I don't know. Um, thank you for taking the time to listen to this episode of Cashing in the Northwest. Don't forget that you could be part of the show. You can leave a comment, ask a question, or give us your opinion on Climate Pledge Arena <clears throat> any time of the day or night. Of course, you can email us at feedback at cashingnw.com. Your support helps keep quality shows coming. So if you like the show, click the Patreon link on the cashingnw.com website and subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and more. Give us a thumbs up or even a review. We want an honest review. It doesn't have to be a five-star review, of course. You know, we like it. But we want it to be honest because that's what we want people to be with us as always. This show is produced by Chris Umpenauer, Jim Powitz, and Jay Kennedy. It's licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Copyright 2020 by Chris Umpenauer. And folks, I urge you, don't change your datum. Don't change your hmm. podcast. Stay tuned for The After Show. Oh, Ed Coaster's got me tickled tonight. Back together <laughs> after five months and you split us up again. Nothing could come between you two. No. What's a few names here and there? Uh, in case you wanted to know, Monkey Cakes is still waiting for a tow truck. AAA doesn't have an ETA. It's turning into a long evening. Yeah, their house sits <laughs> slightly below street level yeah. the location, and they had a car come over the barricades and into their yard this afternoon. So. Somebody decided to park next to their cherry tree. Yeah. From what I understand, there were no injuries, so that's something positive. But. Except for the fence. Yeah. That, uh, that's just not right. Not right at all. Hey, folks. I may have let you down this evening, and I apologize. If you have a fatas that you put in earlier in the show, you copy that and, and put it back in or type it back in now because without a chat lackey. Yeah, I was watching pretty close and didn't see anything okay. go by, but uh, I'm, I'm thinking it's a, it's a hot it. summer evening and people are kind of just chillaxing. Yeah. You know, when you have some a guest on that's a motor mouth, I mean, it's very easy for you guys <laughs> to be checking the chat because then you don't have to do as much talking. Yeah, but we didn't have one of those tonight. Oh, I was wrong. <laughs> oh, well, folks, if there's nothing for Fatas, we wish you good sleep, cool weather, and until next week, get out and get cashing in the Northwest. <laughs>